Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Always have to, you know, check in, see see who uh, see who stumbled in since since uh, we got started. So good to see you all. Amen. Um, we got we got one that's already asleep. So <laughs> try to. Try to limit the, we'll, we'll try to limit the number of people who fall asleep. <laughs> she gets she gets a she gets a break because she's so cute. I'm talking to, I'm talking about a baby. If you, if you're like, what? <laughs> or if you're joining us online and you're like, <laughs> I just I just thought about the live stream right now. Like, one of the things we were talking about, or we ended up talking about uh, with the youth yesterday, Mr. Neal brought it up, is how context is so important, <laughs> right? And so if you've got, if, you've, if you're joining a live stream and there's somebody speaking and you don't know who they are or anything about where they're at, and uh, he's there talking about some sleeping person who's so cute who happens to be a female that that the context is key right <laughs> she's a baby she's with her dad i'm not <laughs> this, is the, this is the world we live in oh man um thank you Lindsay, for leading us this yes. morning um i personally was blessed I, I hope you were as well. Amen. Um, yes. But I but I have to start off, uh, unfortunately, with a with a rebuke, um, which is you might be used to seeing me stand over here at the front, um, and normally that's because I need to avoid the distractions of being in the back um, to just focus on worship. But this morning. Not so. I'm, it's it's a it's a rebuke, but it's in love. Uh, this morning, Lindsay gave the opportunity for anyone who was struggling with joy, right, or hope, joy. I, you put some other words to it um, to come forward, and we could worship around you in support, right? Um, so that was actually me this morning. It, it's been it's been. Um, a roller coaster of a, a week um, for me, and um, yeah, I was I was struggling a little bit yesterday, um, this morning. Um, so anyway, so it was for me. So nobody came around me, and that's okay. Um, but there were people around in support. Amen. Amen. And so, so I was blessed um, by the the way we came together and, and worshiped God um, in that moment. But just the, the the reminder is: don't ever think, don't judge by your eyes with your eyes, Amen. right? Be aware of what the Spirit is saying and what the Spirit is doing in any given moment. Okay, because you might have seen me, hopefully you weren't watching me, right? Because that's awkward. But <laughs> you might have seen me, this is just for real stuff. You might have seen me, you know, with my hands lifted up, or you might have heard me singing loud. That's just me worshiping through junk. That's what that looks like for me. Amen. When I'm struggling, I gotta shout louder. Amen. I'm going to be louder than the noise in my head. That's my. That's just how I. <laughs> that's how I work, right? Amen. I'm going to be louder than the noise in my life. I'm going to. I'm going to worship louder. I'm going to praise harder than the hard things that are happening. Um, I'm going to open up my Bible and I'm going to dig into. Mm -hmm. You know, not just singing the songs, but I'm going to find. And so, Sister Judy, thank you so much. That's exactly where I was. And I was so blessed that you declared it for me that I didn't have to. It was you were you were declaring it over me. It was a blessing. Thank you. Um, so I want you guys to press into that in worship. 
Be attentive to what the Spirit is saying and doing. Don't just sing the songs. Please don't check out completely, especially if you're struggling. That's the moment to press in even more. Amen. And I know it's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to be that person who comes to the front and then everybody's, you know, oh, they're struggling. <laughs> so? <laughs> Pastor Ryan's over here struggling. You come struggle with me. We'll struggle together, right? Amen. We'll worship through our struggles together. That's what we're here for. That's the beauty and value of community and of the family. Amen? Amen. All right, that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But actually, it kind of does. Um, <laughs> prioritize presence. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude the Family Incorporated um, series today um, with prioritizing presence. And so I'll, I'll tie this together, right? So Family Incorporated means we're in this together. So, you know, if you have biological family, i got to not use that word. Um, what's the word I'm supposed to use? Okay. If you have family, um, then you're in that together, right? What happens in your home and in your family dynamic, like you impact each other. Does that make sense? Positively, negatively. Um, when one is struggling, everybody feels it, right? We are to be like a family. Almost like an extended family for each other. Let's, let's put it that way. And so we impact each other, positively or negatively. Right? So that's what we're talking about. And so prioritizing presence, well, we'll get into that more. Let me give a, a quick recap. Um, so this is a series, right? So um, I started out talking about priorities. And so prioritized presence is an, ex an extension of, of that because within a family dynamic, there's going to be an establishing and reestablishing and reestablishing of priorities, okay? But within the family of God, our priorities have already been established. God's not asking us to reassess and reevaluate what the priorities are constantly, okay? So what is a priority? A priority is anything that you regard or treat as more important than something else, okay? It's at the top of the list. You make sure that that happens before anything else, right? Anybody like to eat? Amen. We make that a priority, right? Yes. We're like, I'm hungry, I gotta eat. And everything else has to wait. That's a priority. What are priorities is simply saying, all right, this is my top priority, then this priority falls under that, and those are the things that you know you might be constantly shifting, and sometimes it's a day-to-day -day shift, right? Okay, what are my priorities today? Okay? Um, so it's just a ranking of priorities in order of importance. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get there. So, again, this is a recap, but God has established priorities. Like I said, our priorities as believers, our priorities as a church, family, are not shifting and changing based on the day, okay? So you can take a photo or you can write it down in your notes or whatever. Um, actually, if you need note sheets, we have them in the back. But uh, Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21, God lays out priorities, for us. And I'm summarizing it here saying it's honor God above everything else. So as you're establishing your priorities, it's got to be God, <laughs> and then everything else comes, falls under Him, right? Um, so again, you can study that out for yourself. And then Jesus comes on the scene, right? He's, he's the Messiah, He's the promised one, uh, He's the one that everything is is leading up to. He's the culmination of, of everything that God has, has been doing. And in Matthew 6, 24 through 33, you can summarize uh, how Jesus said it. Jesus said that we should seek the kingdom of God 
above everything else and live righteously. So priority number one is seek the kingdom of God and live righteously. And in doing that, we fulfill God's commandment in Deuteronomy to honor God above all else because the whole of our lives becomes about him, not about us. You guys tracking with me? Yeah. I got to keep it moving or else we're going to go really long. Um, and eventually, did I miss one? Yeah. Oh, there we go. That one messed with me. So then, um, before Jesus uh, leaves the earth and ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, who represent us now, right, make disciples and teach them to obey. Well, he said everything that I've commanded, but to make it fit on the slide, teach them to obey Jesus' commands, because that's what we're supposed to do. That's our priorities now, right? Is honor God above all else, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and to make disciples and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. It's really that simple. Those are our priorities. And they don't change based on how your day is going. They don't change based on what you do for a living. Right? Um, they don't change based on, I'll use myself as an example, they don't change based on how your week went. <laughs> they remain. And so, we get to our topic today of prioritizing presence. Because if, if those are our priorities, and we're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with that, but like, how, right? I believe it all begins with us choosing to prioritize the presence of God. So like what I was saying about being aware of what the Spirit is doing in a moment, like I was using myself as an example. When we learn to become aware of what the Spirit of God is doing in a moment, we become better equipped to fulfill those commands and priorities, right? Because otherwise, what happens? If you're, if you're going about your, your day, your week, your life, based on your own set of priorities, what are you focused on? Yourself. Yourself. Maybe you make yourself feel a little bit better because whatever it is that you do, you know, you try to like look out for other people or help people or whatever, but really it's about you and what you have going on and what you're dealing with. You understand? Yes. So it's, it's really when we start to focus on the fact that God is present with us and wanting to lead us through every aspect of our lives, that's really where we, we become empowered to live these things out. So that's where I want to go. Can I read you a story? Is that okay? Yes. Did anybody actually say no? <laughs> Whenever I ask questions like that, I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if somebody was like, no. <laughs> no, don't read me a story. All right, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. Um, I'm going to give you a, a real quick context uh, before we start reading. Um, I know it says chapter 3. That's where we're going to focus, but I'm going to start reading in chapter 2, uh, verse 12, if you want to read along. Or if you want to make a note. But uh, there was a man, Elkanah, and his wife, Hannah. Um, Hannah was not able to have children. And this was extremely difficult for her. Um, and she, year after year, um, is, is asking the Lord... Um, essentially to heal her, to, to provide her or give her the ability to have a child, specifically a son. Um, and she goes to the temple and she's praying and, uh, <laughs> and the, the priest, Eli, 
Um, he assumes that she's drunk. You ever have you ever prayed in such a way that somebody would have accused you of being drunk? No. Okay. I've probably said some crazy stuff while I was drunk. <laughs> But I can tell you, I've never, I don't think I've ever prayed in such a way that somebody was like, what is wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? And get this, she was up front in church. Did you catch that? She was, she was the one responding. Nobody, nobody called her or invited her like Lindsay did for us this morning. Like, hey, if, you know, if you're struggling or whatever, she was like, I'm struggling. And I need to go before the Lord with this. And she didn't care who saw her or how she looked in doing it. You guys, you guys tracking with me on that? She did not care. She didn't care if people thought that she was <laughs> drunk in church. She wasn't. Let me just clarify. She was not drunk in church. And God grants her request. Mm -hmm. And she has a son. And names him Samuel. And Samuel essentially means um, that I asked God, or God heard me. I've been heard by God. Um, and she made this promise to God, if, if you... If you listen to my request and, and you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Mm -hmm. And so when Samuel is old enough, when he's been weaned, um, she actually goes back to that same place and <laughs> leaves her child there mm -hmm. with Eli, with the guy who accused her of being drunk. Mm -hmm. So... I'm going to start reading in chapter 2, verse 12, and we'll, we'll get to uh, chapter 3 real quick. So you know who Eli is, right? Yes. Eli's the, Eli's the priest. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork, while the meat... Of the sacrificial of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. Now, just to give some context because context is important that is a violation those are violations of the law of Moses right so those are that's in violation of the way in which God said the sacrifices were to be brought to him and so it says the man offering the sacrifice might reply take as much as you want but the fat must be burned first mm -hmm. then the servant would demand no give it to me now or I'll take it by force so the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. Mm -hmm. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one she gave to the Lord. And the Lord gave Hannah three sons and two daughters. Amen. Meanwhile, check this out. Samuel grew up where? Are you reading along? Mm -hmm. In the presence of the Lord. Amen. Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Make a mental note. Now, Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, 
I've been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you are doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against, sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Mm. Meanwhile, there's another, there's another meanwhile. So he's got to pay attention to those things. When it says, but Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Amen. So he's living in the presence of the Lord, grow, growing up in the presence of the Lord, and he's growing in favor with the Lord. One day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. Because, let me, let me clarify, Eli speaks to his sons, they disregard his instructions, and he allows them to continue to serve as priests, and allows them to continue doing the things that they were doing before he reprimanded them. You, you understand? Okay. One day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to you priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? Mm. For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. Mm. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi, I promise that the branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priests, but I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who think lightly of me. The time is coming when I will put an end to your family. So it will no longer serve as my priest. All the members of your family will die before their time. None will reach old age. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel. But no members of your family will ever live out their days. Those who survive will live in sadness and grief. And their children will die a violent death. And to prove what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Mm. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family, and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, Give us jobs among the priests so we will have enough to eat. So that's the word of the Lord to Eli, the priest. So now we're in chapter 3, verse 1. Meanwhile, so while all that was going on with Eli and his sons, and God has already rebuked Eli. Like, Eli is fully aware. You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. His sons are fully aware. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Mm -hmm. And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the Ark of God. Remember, Samuel grew up where? In the presence of God. In the presence of the Lord. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. What is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. 
Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So Samuel grew up where? And then he grew in favor with God. He served the Lord. Did he know the Lord? No. No. Isn't that an interesting detail? Yeah. He spent his whole life in church. But he didn't know the Lord. Hmm. That's me. Is it still you, brother? Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. Remember I said I want you guys to learn to be sensitive to the Spirit? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. You can spend your whole life in church and still have no idea what the voice of the Lord sounds like because you don't actually know the Lord. You can serve him. You can grow up in his presence. You can be in his presence and still not actually know the Lord. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen. Now, for those of you who are here in time, we looked at what the angel, or what Mary, how Mary responded to the angel, which was, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. Okay? Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, Lord. Or speak. Your servant is listening. Hmm. So, what were we talking about? Family? Family Incorporated? Yes. Prioritizing presence? And what I want to highlight is that family, like I said earlier, family means we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Okay? It's more than just existing. It's more than just getting by. It's more than just coming to church. It's literally... We're, we're in this together. Our lives are linked together. And, let's see if this works, God has a purpose for each of us to live out. God has established values for us to live by. Right? And God has vision for each one of us, for us to live out. As individuals, each one of us as individuals, but also as we as individuals come together as a family, God has purpose and values and vision for us, right? So there's this beautiful thing that happens when we come together. Purpose, values, vision. If you have, if, again, if you're taking notes, write those, write those three things down because um, that's what we're going to focus on. Because purpose, values, and vision are found where? In the presence of God. But what did we learn from Samuel's example? Not just being physically around the presence of God, in the presence of God. 
There's a difference. He grew up around the presence of God, but he still didn't know the Lord. Okay? So it's in the presence of God where we discover these things. What is our purpose? What kind of values does God want from us? What's your vision for me, Lord? Why do I even exist? It's found. The answers to all those why questions are found in the presence of God. So, how, if that's so important, right? If, if being in the presence of God is like basically the most important thing that we could do with our time and our lives, then how do we even like seek that out? Right? If you desire it, if you're like, well, I'd like to know what my purpose is and I'd like to know the values that God wants me to live by and I'd like to know the vision that God has for my life, but I don't really know where to start, right? It starts by seeking his presence. Well, what does that look like? How can I seek the presence of God? Because Samuel, just looking at it as an observer, Samuel was doing all the right stuff, right? He was showing up. If, it, if we were talking about our in our context, he was at church. Every, every time something was happening, he was there. And he wasn't just there as a spectator. He was there to serve, right? It says that he served the Lord by serving Eli, the priest. He was there, man. He was in it. He was doing stuff, but he didn't know the Lord. So how? How can we seek it out? Samuel wasn't even seeking it. He was just trying to go to sleep. <laughs> no. I, I believe that he was seeking it because God looks at the heart. Amen. Right? God sees the heart. And he knew what was in Samuel's heart. So, I don't have these on the screen, and there's a reason for that. Because it's on you. It's on you to either take the notes... Remember, whatever you want to do, okay? I'm not going to spoon feed every single thing to you on the screen. <laughs> How can I seek the presence of God? And this, this is biblical. I'm not going to give you the references because you can look them up yourself. You can study these things out for yourself. Amen. That's what we need to do. You can seek the face of God. The face of God. It's your face that I seek, God. I want to see, I want to know you. I want to understand, I want, right? You can seek the heart of God. God, I want to know your heart. I want to understand your heart for me and for people. And you can seek the voice of God. So the face of heart and the voice of God you can seek those aspects of God the voice of God like Samuel who had grown up in the presence around the presence and had grown up serving but still didn't know the voice of God so essentially what those three aspects of converge at is seeking the presence of God. So think about it. Samuel was a child, yet he slept alone by the ark of God while Eli and everybody else was somewhere else because he had to get up and go to where Eli was sleeping, right? He was by himself as a child near the ark of God. The place, that was the, that was the physical place where God's spirit like rested right where God's where God communicated with people it was there at the ark we don't live in that reality now because Jesus ascended and God sent the Holy Spirit right so God is with us Emmanuel mm -hmm. but Samuel in this context he's sleeping right there in the presence Samuel sought the face of God just like his mother Hannah did before he was even conceived mm. This was the same temple, this was the same place where his mother went and prayed to the point where Eli thought she was drunk, right? This is where Samuel lives now. He sought the face of God, and Samuel sought the heart of God by serving others 
in humility. He wasn't like Eli or his sons who served to get for themselves. Do you see the difference? Samuel just served humbly. He was seeking God's heart. And then, finally, Samuel heard the voice of God for himself. So, how can we seek the presence of God? Not in, not in a particular order, but I believe it starts here. Amen. Seek, seek the presence of God in his word. Amen. Study it. Read it. Just, just get into it. Just get into it. You can seek the presence of God in his word. You can seek the presence of God in prayer. Amen. And the word of God will inform your prayers as you seek him. So you're reading the Bible going, God, I want, I want to see you in this. Right? I'm seeking your face. I'm seeking your heart. I'm seeking to hear your voice through your, your word. Amen. And then in prayer, God, this is what your word says. I want... I want to experience this for myself. I want to see this for myself. I want to hear this for myself. Do you see what I'm saying? Right? Yes. You can seek the presence of God through praise and thanksgiving, worship, what we were yes. doing this morning. That's just one aspect of worship. Mm -hmm. The way we handle finances is worship. The way we treat other people is worship. The way we operate within our families is worship. The way we treat, uh, the way we care for other people who aren't able to care for themselves. I think it's in James, it says, true religion in the eyes of God is to care for orphans and widows mm -hmm. and people who are in distress. That's good. You can seek the presence of God in literally doing those things, caring for other people mm -hmm. who can't care for themselves. Amen. Amen. And last, but certainly not least, is sacred solitude. Sacred solitude. Now, if you're a more introverted person, you're like, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's my space <laughs> to seek the Lord, the presence of the Lord. Excuse me. But let me relate it to Samuel real quick. Samuel lived and served in the temple along with the priests. Right? He had constant access, this, the, not this full word of God, but what they had at that time was there. Right, A copy of the Law of Moses and all these things, it was there. He had constant access to it. He was surrounded by the word of God. Samuel would have seen, so that was right the Bible. Prayer. Samuel, living there at the temple, he would have seen and heard the prayers that were constantly offered. Just like his mother came and prayed there, right? And there would have been, um, like, basically ritual prayers that, you know, the, the priests would lead the people in. This is constantly happening there where Samuel's at. And Samuel would have also been in training. He would have also been learning the scriptures so that he could pray the scriptures, okay? Samuel was constantly surrounded by worship by praise because in the law of Moses there's musical requirements and singing that happens in the law he's like a point for me musicians who can play skillfully and a, a, a point for me singers who can sing and lead the people in declaring praise right so Samuel would have been surrounded by these things he was constantly in that type of atmosphere. Samuel served, again, Samuel served in the temple. He was serving Eli, the priest, but he would have also been helping to serve the people who were coming in. Right? Because that's why the priests were there. They were there to like assist, and there was a whole bunch of people that worked with them, to assist the people in their offerings. Right? The priests weren't just there only to do their own thing, they were there to help the people, and Samuel would have helped serve the people. 
And like we said, Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle, um, which is a place, it's representative of a place that's free from distraction. Free from distraction and interference. That's that sacred solitude that I'm talking about. That's a, that's a place where you can seek God. And so if you struggle with that, that's something to ask the Lord to help you with. Like, how can I, where can I, how can I establish a place of meeting with you, God? A place where I can go, right? Do you think it's for no reason that Jesus said, when you pray, go into the closet and shut the door? It's a place of sacred solitude. It might literally be your closet. I mean, if you're a mom of young kids, you can't even go into the bathroom and have sacred solitude. Right? You got fingers coming under the door. And, ah, I need something really bad right now. Right? Moms of young kids need extra prayer from the rest of us. Because they don't get much sacred solitude. <laughs> But it's a way that we can seek the presence. Amen? So, how can we incorporate this, right? Seeking. Seeking. All those, all those things that we just talked about and you, Samuel, as an example for, how can we incorporate those things? Seeking the presence of God in our everyday lives. Now, I've actually gone ahead and highlighted that for you. So, it's incorporate the presence of God every day. If you want to just block out the less important words. Okay? Sometimes we struggle just to focus on, like, what's the point? Incorporate the presence of God every day. Reading the Word. Spending time in prayer. Worshiping. Right? Serving others. Sacred solitude. Every day. Now, we need to do that as an individual. Right? But then, as a family as well. Now, we as a family, as a church family, we do that on Sunday mornings. And other times, you know, we have Growth Wednesday coming up this Wednesday, different things, right? But how are you going to do that? If, if you're a member of a physical family, how are you going to do that? What's that going to look like in your family at home when you're not at church? That's, that's something, for, I'm not going to give you, like, do this, do that. That's something for you to pray about. And if you're married, it's something for you to discuss as husband and wife. How are we going to incorporate seeking the presence of God right here, in our home, in our family, in the context and the challenges that exist in our, in our family life, right? How can we incorporate it? So, I'm just going to give you this. Regular, set-apart time with God. Regular, set-apart time with God. Now, that's for you as it starts for you as an individual. Regular, set-apart time for God. He might speak to you. He might not. But you're going to get into his word. You're going to pray. You're going to give thanks. You're going to worship Him. Right? You're going to seek His presence. Set apart. Time alone with God. Turn off the TV. You don't have to raise your hand. But how many of us are in the habit of falling asleep with the TV turned on? How many of us are... Just junking out on our phones when you know full well you should be going to sleep. But there you are, just beaming right in your eyes. Uh, <laughs> Turn it off. Put it away. I don't care what you have to do. It's not going to be sacred solitude. It's not going to be time set apart alone for God if you've got a screen in your face. See, Samuel didn't have to deal with all this. <laughs> Samuel didn't have these types of distractions. 
but we do, and we have to recognize it and confront it. So turn it off, set it aside, do whatever you have to do to get into that intimate place with God. Even Eli recognized that God was trying to speak to Samuel. And he didn't keep him there with him like, oh, okay, yeah, God's trying to speak to you. You know, let me lead you in a prayer. And he's like, go back by yourself. <laughs> go be by yourself. And listen for his voice. And when you hear him, this is what you should do. Right? He's speaking to a child. And those are his instructions. How much more for us? It's like, I want to, you know, I want to live for God. I want to hear from God. Great. You don't need me. Right? Go to your closet. Take your Bible. Leave your phone outside of the closet. And have some time alone with God. Let him speak to you through that. You guys with me? Yes. All right. So, when you do that for yourself, now you now that's a setup. It's just a setup for if you're living in a family context, you do you're you're doing that alone as a setup for how you're gonna incorporate seeking the presence of God into your family life. Because now you're armed and dangerous, right? You're like, hey, guess what I read. So they're not going to guess. But you can talk about what you read that day, right? You can talk about how you're praying. You can share with each other the cares and concerns, right? And you can, like, start leading each other into, like, oh, you know, well, like, let's, let's look to the Word on that. Let's get into it, Right? You don't have to like come up with some like family devotional guidebook. That might be a good place to start. But when you're getting into it yourself, I guarantee you it's just going to start coming out in conversation. Amen. Like we have we have four boys. They go to public school. They come home sometimes and it's like, "Oh, you know, this happened today or whatever, like I heard this or that." And we're like, okay, cool, let's talk about it. We don't freak out and go, you know, oh my gosh, like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. We're like, cool. This is a great opportunity for us to have a conversation about that. Let's look at what the Word of God says about that. And we're arming them, right? We're arming them in that to know how to distinguish <coughs> lies from truth and light from darkness. You guys... You guys with me? So talk about it. Talk about what you read. And if your schedule doesn't line up, come together later, a different time. Right? If you're single and you don't have somebody at home that you can do this with, phone a friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Call in back up. Be like, hey, I read this today. This is what I think, this, you know, this is what the Lord spoke to me today. How about you? Right? Brother Damien, some of you might receive texts from him. He's like, hey, this is what I read today. You can read it if you want, and we can talk about it if you want. You see what I'm saying? Phone a friend. Bring people together. Amen. And then ask good questions. Did you ever read... Jesus' interactions with people and go, man, he asked some good questions. People would come to him with a question, he'd be like, I'm going to answer your question with another question. <laughs> but it, it forces us to like chop it up, you know what I mean? It, it forces us to dig into it. Instead of, like, again, I'll use Eli and Samuel as an example. Eli could have just been like, alright, this is what you got to do. You know, this is what, this is how God speaks, this is what his voice sounds like. You know, like, ba, 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 ba. I've been serving the Lord for a long time. I got you. But he puts it back into Samuel's hands, even though he's a child, and is like, 
you go that you hear from the Lord this is you know just just say here I am Lord I'm listening right? and he trusts him with that but then he follows up with him later and is like hey the next day he's like hey what did the Lord say to you tell me everything <laughs> isn't that cool tell me everything Like I said, make practical connections between life's issues. Like when our guys come home or whatever, sometimes it's when they're like going to bed and it's like, hey, I've been thinking about this. And we're tired and like, okay, let me sit down. Let's talk about it, right? Let's talk about it. Make practical connections for each other from the word based on the problems of life. Because there's problems in life. Anybody? Yes, definitely. There's a constant conveyor belt of problems. And you're just scanning them through. <laughs> right? And you have the choice to either put them in your cart or be like, returns! Get these out of here, right? And that's what you're doing. when, Because the problems are just going to keep coming. Right? Jesus said, in this world, in this life, you will have trouble. Trouble will come. But take heart, because I've overcome the world. Right? So when our kids, or our spouse, or our friends, when we're phoning a friend, and they're like, man, I'm th I'm, thank you for calling. I've really been struggling with this. Now we have an opportunity, right, to, like, bring connection you're dealing with this this is what God says this is a promise of God let's stand on that together I'm going to stand with you on this promise from God right and instead of taking that problem and scanning it and putting it in your cart it's like send it back put it back on the shelf right we can help each other ooh this is a good one Seek. So if we're seeking the presence of God every day, right, in our lives. Seek out God's discipline. Mm. Seek out God's discipline. And when he gives it to you, when he disciplines you, receive it. Receive it. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I should have asked for it. <laughs> Listen, seek out and receive God's discipline. Why? God was angry with Eli's sons. Because they did not receive, they didn't even seek out. They weren't seeking out discipline. It came to them, and they didn't receive it. They wanted to keep on doing whatever they wanted to do. Right? And God was angry with them because they were blaspheming him. By just continuing to do what they were doing. And check this out. God was angry with Eli. Even though Eli himself, it doesn't say, had done anything wrong. Himself, right? We're individuals, but we're part of a family. God was angry with Eli, even though he hadn't done anything wrong, because he failed to discipline his sons. Eli's sons had prioritized physical satisfaction over the satisfaction that comes from being obedient to God. It's the year of next steps in obedience to God's calling. And it's almost we're almost coming to a close for the year. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And while Eli's sons prioritized Eli's sons prioritized themselves over obedience to God, Samuel prioritized obedience to God over everything else. Amen. And though Samuel could have listen, Samuel could have also eaten from the the way Eli's sons were stealing from the people. He could have received from that as well. 
But he chose not to participate in the sinful things that Eli's sons were doing. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. So, while Eli's sons failed to seek out the discipline of God, and even when it came to them, they failed to receive that discipline, Samuel at the same time is disciplining himself in the Lord. He's seeking out the discipline of the Lord and he's applying it, he's receiving it. Even though he doesn't yet know the Lord. Are you guys with me? He's seeking it and he's disciplining himself. He's not waiting for God to discipline him. You see the difference? And so while God has to execute judgment and discipline on Eli's sons, they are both killed in the same day. You can read it. Mm -hmm. And he executes judgment on Eli. Eli hears the news about his sons both being killed, and he falls over and breaks his neck and dies mm -hmm. in the same day. Mm -hmm. So God had to do that. He had to execute that judgment, but now... According to the prophecy that came to Eli, Samuel is positioned because he's already been disciplining himself. Do you understand? Amen. So what did we start out with? We're all in this together. Church, I grew up with Christian parents, um, but I didn't know the Lord. And because of that, I was like Eli's sons. And I blasphemed God. And I did whatever served myself. And I bore in myself, I, I in myself, took the, the consequence, the penalty for those choices. Just like Eli's sons. But, different from Eli's sons, while I also died, Jesus was there to raise me to new life in him. And that's what he offers to all of us. Now, you might be the same. You might have grown up in church, or at least around church, or you might have had like religious parents or people in your life, right? Maybe you heard one thing, but you saw something completely different, lived out. I know there's some, I know there's people who have had that experience. Oh, people said they loved God, but then they showed who they really were in practice. My heart goes out to you, and I really want to pray for you, that like Samuel, you would not just be around the things of God, but that you would begin to seek God for yourself, and know Him for yourself, like our brother testified earlier. 